Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. You hear anything that move? I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we've got a win to break down as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 294. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Greg Cosell about the Eagles and their win over the previously first-placed New Orleans Saints on Sunday afternoon. What did we take away from the All-22, and what did we see from Jalen Hurts in his first start? What did the offense look like in general? We'll discuss all of that and look ahead to next week's matchup against the Arizona Cardinals right at the top of the show in Chalk Talk. Before we get going with that segment, though, just two quick reminders. Number one, if you have not yet lately, please jump on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. It's the best way to throw us your support in the holiday season as we get closer uh, to the end of the regular season here in the NFL. If you ask a question, I will answer it here always on the show. Also, for those of you who are into the NFL Draft, please go check out the Journey to the Draft podcast as well. We're over there talking NFL Draft, prospects, team building, philosophy, twice a week. Myself, Ben Fennel, Dane Brugler, Ross Tucker. We have a rotation of guests every single week. We have Eagle Scouts on every single week. You're not finding any NFL Draft podcast that has Eagle Scouts on every single week. If you're an Eagles fan, that's a must listen. And we have one every single week right there on the Journey to the Draft podcast, wherever podcasts can be found. All right, that being said, let's dive into our next segment right now in Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, excited to welcome back to the show my good friend, NFL Film Senior Producer Greg Cosell. Greg, uh, we've got a win to talk about, Greg. It's been over a month. Um, a lot to break down, though, coming out of this one. And obviously, everybody wants to talk about the debut for Jalen Hurts. So I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on, on what the film showed from Jalen's first game as a starter. Yeah, it was actually pretty interesting because I, I, I made a bunch of notes. And there's no question there was a lot of poise and a lot of composure. That's what, what really stood out. Um, but what was interesting to me was the approach that they took, Fran. Um, you know, obviously you're starting a a quarterback in his first NFL start against a very good defense. So you're trying to make the game as easy as possible for him uh, so that it's, it's – I don't want to say simple because that's not the right word, but you don't want to ask him to do things that you're not certain he can do in his first NFL start. Um, so what you saw a lot of was – multiple motion concepts. You saw jet motion, you saw orbit motion, um, you saw design boot action, you saw one read concepts, screens, quick game, you saw RPO concepts, you saw zone read, you saw design quarterback runs, multiple kinds, power, draw, pin, pull. Those were all part of the Eagles game plan. So you wanted to play to his strengths. And again, This is not a negative with what I'm saying. This is really good coaching is you're trying to limit his decision making early against a really good defense. Yeah, I think really what you saw uh, in this game was a lot of we have seen the Eagles do this at times throughout the course of the year. I remember early on in the Green Bay game, the first couple drives. Last week against Green Bay, uh, you know, they were doing it, you know, at times they would just kind of get away from it. And so kind of seeing the the game flow work in their favor, the defense played well, the run game was hitting. They were able to kind of keep things going here. You saw them move the pocket. I charted eight times they moved the pocket. You saw five screens that were able to hit. You saw some play action. You saw pre-snap motion uh, used at a pretty high level. They were able to get some good things going with their pre-snap motion outside of the fact of the times when they were in uh, their two-minute drill. They were able to kind of get things going, easy, well-defined completions for Jalen Hurts. And then the multiple run game, they just let that take over, and that was the driving force of the offense and having Jalen Hurts in there. I mean, he, that, you know, he's kind of – obviously, he can do a little bit more with his legs. And so, you know, we saw quarterback power. We saw quarterback draw. Yep. We saw quarterback sweep. Uh, obviously, all the run pass options and all of that as well. But uh, really just a, a very well-diversified attack offensively from the Eagles in this game. You know, and the key thing was because the, the Eagles' defense played so well, um, you know, they got the early touchdown. Uh, and that was actually, you know, a really nice job by um, – 
by Hertz. It was it was zero blitz on fourth and two, and he chose where he wanted to go to the ball. Go with the ball. I think he understood what the protection was going to be, and that the you you needed to leave. Ideally, the protection was going to do the right thing, and you were going to get the outside uh, rusher free. And you know you understand that, and uh, and that was he he understood that. And uh, it was an excellent back shoulder throw. You know, Alexander was clean off the edge, but the, but the timing of the drop and the throw beats that. Um, so that got them ahead in the game. And then the interception, of course, by Riley on a great, great design pressure scheme uh, by Jim Schwartz. And the game played out, quite honestly, so that they could continue to do what they wanted to do. You know, it's funny. Uh, watching the tape, one thing I kept thinking, and it never had to play out. I thought to myself, what was going to be plan B if the game did not play out as it did and they never needed to get to a plan B? It just played out beautifully. I, I feel like, you know, we talk about uh, teams that play this style, right? We talk about, uh, you know, when we when the Eagles were preparing to play uh, the Cleveland Browns, right? And that's the way the Browns try to play is that, hey, uh, you know, we're going to run the football and Baker Mayfield is not going to be the driving force. It is going to be run game, run game, run game. What happens when you know that goes off schedule? You know, can Baker Mayfield go and win it? And that's going to be the question that they're going to have to answer uh, at some point over the next three weeks, right? Is uh, and I, Doug Peterson was asked about that in his Monday press conference. Like, yeah, like well, we're going to have to have an answer uh, for that because you're not going to just be able to come out and do this way, you know, operate this way every single time you come and take the field. But uh, it was just, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, the calm and poise, I thought really stood out to me. He did a good job of making the right decisions. Uh, there were very few negative plays for the Eagles offense in this game. Uh, they had some penalties, a lot of pre-snap penalties that they'll have to kind of get worked out. I would imagine the new cadence for the quarterback had something to do with that would be my guess. Um, but I think ultimately, uh, when you're talking about Jalen Hurts, you know, he gets out of the pocket throws the ball away. Uh, you know, he was able to be decisive with the football in terms of taking off when he needed to as a scrambler. He picked up 50 plus yards uh, on scrambles, which was certainly good. Um, you know, you know, put them in position to get a field goal uh, before halftime with his ability uh, to make some plays there. But the, the design of the offense was, was impressive. They did some good things in the run game. They did some good things in the pass game. Uh, it was a, a, just a very well-rounded performance from the Eagles offense from that standpoint. Yeah. And then as we said, because they had all these one read concepts, you know, everybody talks about going through progressions, you know, and, and again, are there times when you have to go through a progression? Of course, we know that, but you know, you don't always have to do that. There's a lot of one read concepts in the NFL and whether it's a screen game, whether it's an RPO, these are not, you know, multiple reads. These are one read concepts and they were able to do that. And, you know, I, I think that the game played out as such and, and you know, they were very, they were very fortunate and we don't know exactly how Hertz is coached, but you know, you wonder too, if on the, some of the plays where he ran, if, if they say to him, Hey, if you drop back and you don't feel comfortable, just take off. His legs are a major part of his, of his game. And uh, you know, obviously he was not sacked because he's not, he's a different quarterback than Wentz in the sense that all through his career as a player his legs have been a major part of his game probably going back to when he was 10 years old so he's the kind of quarterback that when he doesn't see it he's going to move and that that's just built into his dna so greg there were a couple plays uh one was very early i, I think it was actually the second play of the game um you know uh, he was uh jalen hurts handed the ball off to miles sanders as a run to the left for three yards second play what stood out to me, though, You're talking about the quarterback power, or no, or no, no, the it was the second play was a, uh, I believe it was a zone read or a, to the left hand side. He handed the ball off to Sanders, and Sanders went to the left for three. Before the snap, Greg Ward po pointed out that he had a cap nickel over him, that there was a, a potential for a slot pressure. Jalen Hurts came to the line of scrimmage, looked like he was kind of changing things up. And they ended up running away from the blitz, and I, and I thought that was just kind of good communication, uh, guys on the same page there. But the, from the on the back side of it, I would say the the one play that you, you kind of look at and say, okay, this is where Hertz needs to get better. It was on that Goddard 19 yard completion. I believe, I believe it was third quarter. It might have been late second quarter. Uh, but basically, Jalen Hertz dropped back. He had a two man route concept over the middle for whatever reason. Didn't throw it. Held on to the football. The protection was good. And oh then yeah, he yeah, yeah. Dumped it off to Goddard, and Goddard was able to make a play. But that's an example of yeah. like, okay, this is where the rookie. You know, this is the next step. 
that needs to be taken, uh, you know, in terms of being able to execute the offense. So overall, I mean, that's the, that was the negative play that I kind of took. Obviously, the fumble, he needs to be able to protect the football, especially in that situation. Um, but overall, I mean, look, he didn't take any sacks. Uh, he didn't throw any picks. He threw the one pass along the sideline that, you know, it could have been picked, you know, going back the other way. But just a, really, a, a good performance for, uh, from Jalen Hurts. Certainly, uh, you know, give a lot of credit to him. Uh, give a lot of credit to the coaches for getting him ready. No question. You know, and it's funny how games play out because that play you just spoke about, if Gardner Johnson catches that and takes it in for a touchdown, that would have put the Saints ahead. And who knows what happens then? And Maybe we're having a totally different conversation. No question. Hey, let me ask you a question. The Miles Sanders 82-yard touchdown. Yeah. How do you feel? How do you see that play out from the from the linebacker standpoint from Quan Alexander? Do you feel he's trying to go back door? Do you feel that he's trying to press the line of scrimmage and get that double team off of the guard, or off of the uh, the nose tackle? How do you feel that he's trying to play that there um, in terms of getting out? Because you know, the, to me, he's going back door there, and that opens up that gap for Sanders to be able to get downhill. Do you feel like that was purposeful to try and just say I need to attack to try and let, get my nose tackle clean? How, how did you see him playing that? I mean, you know, without knowing how everything's coached, I thought he hit the wrong gap. Yeah, it was tough. It was uh, we watched it back a bunch of times today. Yeah, to I did a, too. A good sense for it. I mean, I thought he hit the. I thought he hit the wrong gap. The the other play that you know obviously was bad. And that, look for on that one, the eighty two yard touchdown. Great job by Miles Sanders running through that tackle from uh, from Malcolm Jenkins. He's been a big play machine for the Eagles this year. Uh, some of his biggest games. I mean, you've got you've, a lot of big time runs. Uh, from Sanders in those kind of scenarios. But uh, the other g- big play that I really like, number one, we saw Mesh a couple of times uh, in this game. One was a big completion, 39 yards to Jalen Rager. Good to see that uh, back in the offense. And then uh, one of the other big ones was the end around to Jalen Rager. Well, that always helps too when the defense busts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that does, that does help. It always helps when the defense busts because everybody played zone except Gardner Johnson, who was playing man coverage, and he ran inside with Ertz. So, you know, that, that helps that, that, yeah. that, that can often lead to big plays, but you know, even though like, okay, that was a 39 yarder and it would have been a big play or it wouldn't have been a big play at the end of the day, it goes back to what we were saying earlier in terms of a well-defined completion. Like, why do we like mesh? It's because it's got answers against man. It's got answers against zone. He, he drops back. He's able to read the coverage. That was the first read the coverage. That was the shortest, uh, the shortest shallow cross. And they happened to bust on that side and it turned into a big play, but it just, you know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier in terms of the well-defined completions. Uh, Going over to the to the offensive line here, Greg. Uh, what were your thoughts on, on Jack Driscoll, Jordan Mailata? Any takeaways just from watching uh, the offensive line as a whole from your notes? Well, you know it's funny. I mentioned a Hertz three yard run on fourth and two on the first possession. That was the quarterback power. Sure. Yep. I mean, Mailata just his block on Rankins was just ridiculous. It was outstanding. He literally moved Rankins off the ground. I mean, and then he had another great block. Uh, on another play, which I'm trying to remember, it was the it was, was it the QB counter um, or the QB sweep, not the QB counter. No, no, it was, it was Sanders seven down. yards on second and ten on the second possession when he blocked Davenport. Yes, correct. Yep, yep, yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, he had the the one that I was thinking was the third. I believe it was third and four. I thought Milano played well in this game. By yeah, the way, I thought he had a good game. Uh, I thought. See, the now offense- I, here's a perfect example to me. You talk about coaching, and then we can move on. I thought that. You know, the, the nature of the offense camouflage the offensive line's potential weaknesses. Because if you're just going to line up and say Jack Driscoll's got to block Cameron Jordan, that's not going to happen. Yep. But, but the, the nature of the offense and how they ran it just totally camouflaged any weakness uh, that they might have on the, with the offensive line, particularly uh, on the edge, you know, with Driscoll against uh, the Saints. So, you know, that's coaching. You know, we talked about the kinds of things they did. And the game played out that they did not have to have a drop back passing game. You know, Greg, it's this is probably a conversation for another day. You know, for the off season when we can re- have like the big overarching discussions and philosophical, uh, you know, uh, conversations. But you know, people talk about quarterback friendly offense, and I, they used to be like a dirty word, and you don't you don't say that anymore. And uh, but I, I think you you look at the way that you know a lot of offenses around the NFL operate these days. I think seven years ago, eight years ago, we would say, oh, well, that's quarterback friendly. It's gimmicky. But the, the thing is about those offenses, you say this about like the LA Rams and, uh, you know, Sean McVay is, oh, well, that's quarterback friendly. But you know, you know what else that also helps? It helps the receivers. It helps the offensive line. It helps everybody. So kind of speaking to your, to your point, uh, I, yeah, I, like they're doing things to help out Jalen Hurts and, you know, keep him comfortable. But 
That also helped out the offensive line. That helped create separation for the receivers underneath. You were able to get guys out. I mean, it helps everybody. If, if the quarterback's working, everybody's working. Yeah, and, and you know, the nature of, of, of how you structure an offense, like you said, does help everybody. Yeah. You know, um, so it was, a, it was a really well-designed offense. And the key thing, and we're going to get to this now, I guess, is the defense. The defense allowed the offense to play that way the whole game because I don't – there may have been one or two at most, but I don't really remember situations where they had to drop back. I mean, obviously, when you get to the end of the first half, you know, when they go on that drive where Ellie missed the field goal – that's by choice where you're dropping back because you, you know, you you don't have to, if you don't want to, that's your choice. They right. weren't do a lot of third and long situations where you were forced to drop back and the defense could show you a lot of different things. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. I think also, I mean, you started talking about the defense, the, the defensive line in this game was absolutely dominant. They were awesome. I mean, totally dominant. And it, and one across the board, there was, so many players who were dominant throughout the game. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I like picking out a, guy, a couple guys here and there, and I thought Fletcher Cox was really good. I thought we saw some great things from Lee Jackson and, Brand, and Brandon Graham, uh, Derek Barnett. The two guys were, to me, Josh Sweat, obviously, and, and Javon Hargrave. I thought those two guys really, really flashed to me uh, in this game. I don't know if there, was a, if there was a different guy or two for you, but I agree with you that the defensive line as a whole was, was dominant in this performance. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there, you know, you could – Hargrave was great. Sweat, I mentioned Sweat um, in my notes. Uh, obviously, he's not on the defensive line, but I thought Singleton was phenomenal in this game. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that we saw a lot of good things from Singleton. You know, the best thing for me – like, maybe people will say, like, oh, why – what is it that makes Singleton good? I think his decisiveness downhill, which can, which can uh, hurt him at times, but his decisiveness downhill – uh, is really good, especially in this scheme, because it helps pull the double teams off the defensive tackles. It helps those guys, uh, you know, create some one-on-one matchups. And obviously, he can get into the backfield and make some plays too. And with his burst, uh, he's got the ability to get downhill and make some plays. In this game, he did that. Um, you know, I think that this was definitely one of his better games overall as an Eagle. Well, it's funny. Here's what I typed: Singleton continued to flash with his aggressiveness and decisiveness as far as play reaction, play uh, recognition, and reaction. That's what I typed. So we're on the same page there, Fran. Yeah, I, I say, it always makes me feel good when you when I'm saying things that that you put down in your notes. Um, yeah, I thought the the defense just overall it was, it was a phenomenal. You know what? It's and obviously, and I hope people don't take this the wrong way. Jalen Hurts was phenomenal given what he was asked to do. Okay, yeah. so and and the poise and composure were off the charts. But at the end of the day, he really wasn't asked to do a ton. And the defense allowed the game to be played the way that it was. Yep. And, 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 and obviously, when Sanders goes 82 yards near the end of the first half, that, that really then changed the whole game as well. So, uh, and the Eagles had a couple of short fields, which they've not had all season. Yeah, I mean, the, the Duke Riley interception uh, certainly gave him a short field. You're able to get a field goal there. Uh, you talk about the 82-yard run by Sanders. I mean, that right there, that's 10 points. They were up 17-0 going into the locker room. So, um, to me, going back to that Riley interception. Oh, I was just going to say, we got to talk about that. We got to talk about it. There was a, there was a lot of layers uh, to that play. Tell us what, what stood out most to you uh, about the interception. Well, it came out of nickel. Saints were in a two-by-two two set. The play call was a called screen to the boundary to Alvin Kamara. The Eagles did what we call a four-man zone exchange concept, meaning that they only rushed four and they played zone coverage behind it. And it was actually cover two invert, which means that the corners drop back in a sense as the deep half field safeties and other players, you know, underneath defenders, um, they become in a sense the corners. Um, but the reason it's called a four-man zone exchange is – you add it's a four man rush essentially, but one or two of the rushers, in this case, two of the rushers, are not defensive linemen. They brought Mills from the boundary edge and Roby from the field edge. And, and like I said, they played inverted cover two behind it. Both Roby and Mills got in clean, and Hill did not read this at all. And he thought he'd look to his right and then come back comfortably to Kamara to the boundary side. And, you know, he thought he was going to help uh, the whole play. But all of a sudden, Mills was right in his face and forced him to throw, make a hurried throw. 
and he threw it way too hard to Kamara, bounced off him right into Riley's hands. And Riley was actually the corner to that side in the inverted cover, too. Yep, he was the he was the buzz player playing in the yep. flat, you know, where you would normally see a corner playing in in cover two. Uh, and you know, Johnny on the spot made the play. I mean, great reaction quickness by uh, Riley there to finish for the. Just a great scheme, a great yep. scheme. Yeah, well, oh, that that to me was like as perfect. Like if you're making that blitz call, that's how that's teach tape. Like that's going on. That's going on every single one of the reels for all the defensive coaches uh, if they install that anywhere moving forward. Um, you know that whole concept now. These four man zone exchange pressure concepts. Yeah, um, they are becoming bigger and bigger in the NFL now. So many teams are showing pressure looks, then rushing four, and one or two of the four are DBs or a linebacker, and that's why we call it a zone exchange pressure because it's not a four-man D-line rush. Yeah, something maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later here uh, in the show. Um, so we talk about the Riley interception. We talk about the defensive line. Obviously, a lot of injuries uh, for this Eagles secondary. Uh, Rodney McLeod oh. out for the year uh, with a torn ACL. That is obviously unfortunate. He, he's had a, a very good year um, for the Eagles. Very uh, good year. Yeah, so that's that was tough to see. Um, you know, I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts because obviously both corners uh, left this game, Avante Maddox uh, and Darius Slay. Thoughts on – uh, on Jalen Mills uh, in this game. He had to go out and play some corner. Um, we saw him obviously start at safety. Is you kind of get your thoughts on, on Mills, not just for this game, but then also overall what your takeaways have been from him uh, so far this season? Well, I think he's been very up and down as a safety. I mean, just I'm just reacting to what the film shows, Fran. You know, that's what I do. Um, I think he's had some games where he was active and some other games where he's not been active. And, uh, you know, I can't answer why. Um, I guess he'll play corner now. You know, one of the things that was interesting in this game is because of the injury, they only played five snaps a dime. They ended up playing a ton of college. So I think percentage new function of the injuries and the remaining personnel. I think the other thing that really stood out in this game was how much split safety they played um, and how much zone they played. And I think that was also a function of the injuries. Um, you know, normally they're not a split safety defense, but they played a ton of cover two in this game. They did, uh, and now I'll be interested to see if that's something that continues uh, moving forward with the injuries uh, to Maddox, you know, to McLeod. We'll see what Slay's status is uh, as we move through uh, the rest of the week as we prepare for the, the matchup against the Arizona Cardinals. So uh, I guess that's an easy transition uh, into those Arizona Cardinals, Greg. Let, let's talk about this because um, this is a team that I feel like a lot of people were very excited about coming into the year, rightfully so. You've got some, you know, some very uh, – Look, uh, some young talent uh, on that team. And certainly one of the brighter stars, uh, emerging stars in Kyler Murray, a former number one pick uh, out of Oklahoma, Heisman Trophy winner. Um, you know, you've got a star receiver in DeAndre Hopkins. You've got good players on the defensive side of the ball. What have you seen from them on film o- over the last few weeks? It's, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, I think, just kind of watching them over the last month and change. I, I think it's been a mixed bag going back to last year with Kyler Murray. Mm. I think he's a uh, – a spectacular player, but not a consistent player. Um, they're an individual play passing team with Murray. There's no rhythm to their passing game. Murray is a splash player capable of spectacular plays at any time with his arm or his legs. And that's the issue. He's, he's capable of that any time, but he lacks consistency. But we know his legs present a problem on any play, both by design and by improvisation. That always presents problems for the defense. Um and, and, you know, he's certainly capable of big-time throws and special throws, uh, but there's there's not really a consistency uh, to to what he is as a passer, even though he's got a really good arm. Yeah, I think that when you look at I mean, he's certainly got the ability to uh, extend plays, make plays outside the pocket. He, I mean, he's done that throughout the course of this season. Um, you know, he's got outstanding arm talent. Uh, it's a matter of just consistency within the structure of that offense. Uh, let's talk real quick just about what that offense looks like because, um, you know, it's going to be a little bit different, I feel, than what most people are used to looking at, and, uh, you know, from a, um, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, it's a heavy wide receiver screen offense. You're not going to see a lot of uh, receiver distribution and variation. I mean, everybody kind of, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, he's going to line up on the left. Christian Kirk, mostly going to line up on the right. Larry Fitzgerald, he's going to be in the slot. Uh, with him, he was out of the lineup for a few weeks. It was Andy Isabella. He's going to be in the slot. They're going to go from 10 personnel to 12 and back again. Uh, zone run game, not a lot of variety in terms of that. It's uh, it's pretty kind of cut and dry. They're, they're relying on speed and tempo. Um, kind of reminiscent in some ways uh, of the way that the Eagles played under Chip Kelly. And say, Again, in some ways, not ex- exact, but 
Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of interesting kind of takeaways uh, and that it'll look a little bit different than what people are used to seeing uh, on Sundays. No, you're right. I mean, it, to me, it's not a tactically difficult offense. You know, they, they play out of 10 personnel more than any team in the league, close to a quarter of their snaps. But they also play at a 12 personnel probably far more than people would think because you think of Cliff Kingsbury and the air raid offense and you think spread. Um, but, for instance, 54 percent of, of Kenyon Drake's rushes this season have come at a 12 personnel. You they're, know, third, they're third in the league in 12 personnel. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're not you're right. They're not a big I mean, yes, they do a lot of different things in terms of personnel but not a ton of different things in, in terms of concept exactly right yep and that's an air that is an air raid philosophy that is a uh, a mike leach uh, philosophy in terms of um you know we're going to run a lot of the same plays over and over again and run them so well we're going to out execute you uh is the idea and we're going to count on our quarterback in the passing game to know yep. where to go with the football exactly right right uh, you know and for that reason i mean they, they don't have a lot of pre-snap motion they're going to run a good amount of tempo uh they're going to you know they're going to try and line up and we're going to beat you and they've got a guy on the outside, by the way, and DeAndre Hopkins, who he finds ways to beat you. He's, uh, he's, he's, pretty, uh, good. he's, he's pretty good player. Uh, yeah. What have you seen from Hopkins and, and just his connection uh, you know, with Kyler Murray this year? You know, Hopkins is just a really, really good player. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I thought that Devontae Adams was the most complete receiver in the game. Hopkins would be right there. Um, you know, he's, he's physical. He's competitive. I wouldn't call him explosive, but he's not unexplosive. He's just, you know, he's not, he's not a, he's always been an odd guy for me and he's phenomenal. So I don't want people to think, I don't think he's a great player, but he's not a twitchy guy, you know, but he just, he's a really nuanced route runner, um, has a great feel for using his body. Um, I I just think he has such a good understanding and plus he catches everything. I mean, he, he just has. For, you know, his hands remind me for people, and I'm sure in Philly they remember this, but his hands almost remind me of Chris Carter. He catches everything. Yeah, uh, no no question. I mean, he certainly has uh, some of the best hands in the NFL, if not the best set of hands. And the guy uh, sharing that receiver room with him, Larry Fitzgerald, uh, is one of those guys. He has pretty good hands, too. (laughs) He's one of those guys as well. Um, Christian Kirk, I should kind of get your thoughts. You watch these guys every week. I've only been watching them for the last week and change. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on how he's developed? Former second round pick out of Texas a and I, I was pretty high on Christian Kirk. I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts, big picture, uh, on how he's developed and, and what he can be in this offense. Um, I like Christian Kirk. You know, I think this offense, because there's not a ton of rhythm to it, is a week-to-week proposition as far as targets for, for players. You know, I, I think if the uh, if the pass game had a little more rhythm, a little more stability and continuity, I think Kirk would end up with big numbers. You know, and fantasy people would be very excited. But I think because the offense is not like that and it's very much an individual splash play offense, there'll be weeks he can make a big play. and other weeks, it feels like, where's Christian Kirk? But I like the player. Yeah, he's a guy that certainly has flashed to me uh, watching them on film. Um, let's go over to the, the defensive side, Greg, because they've got a lot of speed at the second and third level that's really impressive. It's a shame because I, I love watching Chandler Jones. And he oh, got, yeah, yeah. He got hurt early in the year, um, so he is not playing for those. It's good for the Eagles, but uh, you know, just from watching them on film, it's a shame to not see uh, 55 out there. Uh, Corey Peters, another guy, a starter out for them. They were missing Jordan Phillips, who was disruptive early in the season for them. Then he was out, came back this past week, and then left with a calf injury. Uh, no update on, on his status, I believe, uh, moving forward into this week, but uh, at least as of this recording. But I think uh, ultimately when you look at this group, it's about the back seven, you know, in my mind. You, you look at, obviously, a former Eagle there uh, in Jordan Hicks at middle linebacker. Uh, you've got the rookie Isaiah Simmons who's starting to kind of come into his own. You get, then you have that secondary. Patrick Peterson, not quite the player he was, but still a very good corner. Uh, Buda Baker, the richest safety in NFL history. Uh, Byron Murphy in the slot. They, I mean, they've got speed, talent, pedigree. It, it's, a, it's a versatile group. It's a fun group to watch. No, um, you know, I think Buda Baker is really, really good. I, I love watching Buda Baker. You know, he's he's a twitchy athlete. He's an explosive athlete. He can play post safety. He can play split safety. He can play in the box. He's aggressive downhill. He sees it and goes. He's a very good blitzer. He's a complete safety to me. I really like watching Buda Baker. Mm. And they're starting to play Isaiah Simmons more and more. Uh, I think early in the year he was thinking through the games. Um, and he's now showing up a lot more on film. And he could be a me really significant factor in this game because he's such a fine athlete and with Jalen Hurts and and what is likely to be the Eagles 
you know, similar approach overall with the run game and Hurts as a significant part of the run game, I would think someone like Isaiah Simmons could even see more snaps this week. You might see him play a little more in the in the base defense if they choose to go that route. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. Uh, overall, how have you kind of seen him? Because uh, obviously you've been watching this team on a week-to-week basis. It seemed like I mean, early on, they were not afraid to kind of say, okay, you be the tight end matchup guy. Hey, you're going to match up on this running back this week in man-to-man. Has that kind of been what the role has been throughout the course of the last few weeks in your mind, or has it changed a little bit and he's becoming a little bit more uh, involved in the entire defensive game plan? Um, He still plays predominantly, predominantly in sub. Um, Occasionally, he'll get a snap in the base. You know, there'll be times he'll play on the ball as in an outside linebacker position. Predominantly, he plays off the ball. A few weeks ago, he played some snaps at safety. Um, you know, so they, I, I think they probably put a lot on his plate, and it just mm. took time because he's got the kind of skill set where he can be one of those multi-dimensional or, or to use the invoke term, positionless players. But this is the NFL, and it doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah, I think he's going to be a, an interesting case study for sure. A lot of people uh, obviously have filed the NFL draft. We've been talking about Isaiah Simmons now uh, for over a calendar year over on the journey of the draft. Oh, game. yeah. Uh, you know, and I think people just assumed he'd step right in and be great, you know, right off the bat. And, you know, it, it's a little different. You know, the NFL is a little different. you got to learn how to play one position before you can play multiple positions. You right. know, we used to talk about that when Miles Jack came in the league and, you know, he was a still is a great athlete. He's actually having a really good season, probably his best season in the NFL Hmm. for a bad uh, Jacksonville team. But, you know, everybody said, oh, he can play anywhere. He can line up outside and cover Julio Jones. Well, no, he can't, you know. And and, and Simmons is the same way. He's a great, great athlete, but there's some things he's not going to be able to do. And then you have to find out what he can do within the context of your defense. See, that's the other thing. He's not there playing himself. The, the other aspect of this matchup, Greg, and you mentioned one in terms of Isaiah Simmons and his ability to kind of be a potential quarterback spy against Jalen Hurts. Yep. This is a defense that, I don't know if it's talked about, but they are one of the most uh, highly aggressive defenses in the league. I believe yes. right, right now uh, they are, give me one second, they're sixth in sacks, they're fourth in blitz rate. Uh, they get after the quarterback. I mean, they're yeah, willing and- to pressure, and they with a lot of speed on the field at, at any given time. And they play a lot of man. And again, that raises the question of will they do that against Jalen Hurts? Right. You know, again, the key thing when you're playing the Eagles, particularly with Hurts now, is to try to get the Eagles in third and long. And then because that's where at this point we don't know how the Eagles will fare with Jalen at quarterback because they didn't really face much of that this past week, which is great for the Eagles. And obviously you're you're that's you're playing not to be in third and nine. Um, so we'll see because they do play a lot of man coverage and we'll see if they were to continue to do that. But, you know, you mentioned Patrick Peterson. He's not what he was three or four years ago, but he's a good player. Um, I could easily see them in this game saying, you know, Hey, you just play one-on-one, whoever it is, it doesn't matter. And then we have a lot of people who can line up, you know, elsewhere and be, uh, and, and really help out in a lot of different ways. And that's what kind of you know gives me a little bit of concern is that uh, they are very multiple with their blitz packages. They'll come up on third and long and put all their speed on the field. They'll take all their defensive tackles off, yeah. and you'll see a couple edge rushers. You'll see all linebackers, safeties, corners, all line up on the line of scrimmage. You don't know who's coming, who's dropping, and they'll send somebody that's not on the line of scrimmage from, yeah. you know, from seven yards away outside the formation and then they're dropping four guys off the line of screen. It's a lot to think through from a quarterback standpoint, especially a young quarterback. No, I agree. And that's, you know, if, if they are able to get the Eagles in some longer yardage situations, you'll see them line up in six and seven man fronts, because not only does that put pressure on Hurts, but that puts pressure on the protection. Because then you got to figure out who do you think is coming? How are you going to protect? Because protection is set before the snap. You can't change your protection in the middle of the play. And, and you know how defensive coordinators are. Vance Joseph's been doing this a long time. You know, they know how the Eagles protect. So, you know, you set your your fronts saying, hey, they're going to protect this way. So we know if we show something, we'll make them do something in their protection. And, you know, I think Jalen Hurts is a really smart kid and he's played a lot of football, you know, high level college football. But he hasn't been in the NFL that long and some of this stuff will be new to him. That's right. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a big test. So this, uh, as I said, this is a fast defense. Uh, you know, they've got playmakers on that side of the ball, guys that can take the ball away. Uh, they can get after the quarterback. Hassan Reddick had five sacks this week. Oh my uh, God! The New York yeah. Giants are against. Yeah, the and by York- the way, 
they're really good with stunts, really yeah. good with stunts. That's something, you know, that we I'm glad, you know, we mentioned that because they they are really good with stunts. The TE stunts are their specialty. And, you know, both Golden and, and, and Reddick are really good as loopers in the stunt game, uh, especially Reddick because he's a flexible kid. You know, we all remember him from Temple. Um, he was a very good pass rusher there. They initially, with a different coaching staff, tried to make him a stack backer, but he's really an edge player. He's he's a um, he, he, he's an edge rusher. Yeah, it's going to be a, a big test here um, for this Eagles offense for sure. Well, Greg, uh, excited to break it all down with you later next week uh, here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. Thanks once again for joining us for Chalk Talk, and we will talk to you a week from now. All right, fan, thanks. Experience the fastest internet and more in a snap. With Xfinity XFi, you get the speed, coverage, control, and security you need for the ultimate in-home Wi-Fi experience. Xfinity, proud partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Great stuff from Greg, who you could follow on Twitter, just like I do, at Greg Cosell. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's Nose content that we produce with Eagles Entertainment. You know I greatly appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That is one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. I want to give a shout-out today to someone who did just that. The Scouts Dot left us a five-star review on our Apple Podcast page saying, Hey, friend, enjoyed listening to you and Ben talk about how the Saints like to run bit of a vanilla offense as opposed to the Rams who like to use a lot of motion and confusion. Defenses know what the Saints are going to do, but the Saints just execute so well so it's hard to stop. I was wondering, do the Eagles run a similar style of offense, but are they having trouble executing? Thanks for the hard work. Uh, Scouts. Look, I think when you uh, to sit here and say, I know, you know, knowing the answers to why the Eagles offense has struggled over the course, you know, the majority of the season, I, I can't sit here and say that I've got answers, right? I, I, you know, obviously I would not be sitting in this chair if I did have answers. I think ultimately when you look at offenses around the NFL, there are two kind of major schools of thought, especially when you're looking at the, the whole idea of motion. But really, it's, it's a lot of different aspects of it. There are positives and negatives to everything. And as we talked about in that segment, when you're looking at motion, the positives is that you can gain some information from the defense. You can manipulate some defenders defensively. You can open up some lanes in the run game. You could do a lot of different things with it. On the, po- on the negative side of that, though, you also get the defense moving a little bit. It changes the picture for the quarterback. And so ultimately... The quarterback may like it. He might not like it. There are, might, there are some guys that maybe they didn't like it earlier in their career and they get realize, hey, they kind of open their eyes and say, oh, you know what? This is actually a pretty good thing. I think Aaron Rodgers is a great example of that. He was It was known that he was not a big fan of pre-snap motion even last year. You know That's why they didn't really use it that much and he wasn't that big of a fan of it. And now they use it all the time and you can see the, the kind of the results that they're having. So there are pluses and minuses to everything. If, if, if everything was great, everybody would do it all the time. So differently uh you know their offense does look a little bit differently when it's Taysom Hill as opposed to when it's Drew Brees they're a little bit more vertical with their pass game uh you know they do a little bit more in terms of timing and rhythm and they make more touch kind of throws uh with Drew Brees in there as opposed to when it's Taysom Hill uh they got Alvin Kamara more involved in the pass game this week that had not really been the case so you're always going to cater a little bit um but ultimately you're still going to maintain that philosophy and I think you know when you look at uh what the Saints do what the Rams do there are definitely identities to that, right? They they have staples. They've got core concepts. They like to run time and time again. They're going to find different ways to kind of package those uh, and figure out how to be able to move the football consistently. So, look, to say, like, you know, is that why the Eagles aren't executing is because they're trying to, to just be an ex, you know a, a vanilla offense and they're going to try and read the defense. That's tough for me to say because I'm not in that room. I will say, you know, just watching the film, no matter what the Eagles have done for the most part of this season – it has not over. It has not looked the way that they would want it to look, right? They haven't been able to run the ball with the consistency. They haven't been able to execute in the screen game or the vertical pass game. Uh, you know, they've tried lots of different things: pre-snap motion or no motion. They've tried play action or not play action, move the pocket or stay stationary. Everything. It's been a lot of mixed results. It's been largely a mixed bag, right? So uh, the Eagles are just trying to find. What is it that we can say we can do really, really well coming out of this game as we talked about? And they were able to get the run game going. And it was a little bit of a different look this week. But look, the the insertion of Jalen Hurts provided that spark that Doug Peterson was looking for. We'll see if they can keep it going here, uh, you know, whether it's this week or if it's going to be through the rest of the season. Certainly something to watch. But Scott Stout, really appreciate that that question. Great question from you. Hope you got the answer uh, that you were looking for. Sorry, it's, it's a re- weird thing to talk about because – 
it's obviously it's a uh, you know look the the offense has been just been trying to find those answers for a large majority uh, here of the season. They just been not hitting uh, on all cylinders for sure. Special thanks uh, this week to Greg Cosell and all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings on Eagles Entertainment. All that being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Duffy House, I'm Fran Duffy. We'll talk to you later this week. Give the gift of Eagles Virtual Youth Clinics, now offering unique two-day football and cheer programs live on December 29th and 30th. Register today at PhiladelphiaEagles.com slash clinics.